From the star in Frisco, Texas and the Dallas Cowboys headquarters, we welcome you into one final edition of Special Edition with Isaiah Stanback, Barry Church, Nate Newton. I'm Kyle Yeomans. The Dallas Cowboys fall in the wild card round 23 to 17 to the San Francisco 49ers at AT&T Stadium, and it wasn't the way that it was drawn up for Mike McCarthy in the 12 and 5 NFC East champion Dallas Cowboys. They got off to a slow start, fell behind 13 to nothing and ultimately didn't have an answer toward the end. And there were a lot of things, a lot of talking points to go around, but I'm going to start it very general with you guys. What were your general general thoughts in terms of the way that the Cowboys season came to an end? I think there's really two things when I think about this, this Cowboys uh, team uh, holistically going into the playoffs. I think they were intimidated, and I think they were unprepared for this level of competition. Both teams really showed up. Obviously, they showed up, and they just got punched in the mouth. Um, and, and in terms of not being prepared, things that we knew that, that, that San Francisco was going to present, they seemingly still did not handle things accordingly and weren't prepared to take those things on and take those aspects out of the game for 49ers. So, intimidated. And unprepared. Yeah, to me, it just boils down to one word, and that's disappointing. I mean, going into this game, uh, I think you were the better team overall. You had the number one offense. I think your defense took the ball away better than anybody in the playoffs at that time. You were playing at home, and you were relatively healthy overall. So there was no excuses for Mike McCarthy or this team to go out there and perform the way they did. But the 49ers came in and bullied us, and to me, that's disappointing. You, you started at the beginning of the season that you was going to take care of this team and make sure it was, it was, it was healthy. It went into the playoffs very, very healthy. It did not hold up. You know, you were 12 and 5 during the regular season. You picked, you had the perfect match. I mean, all you had to do was stop the run. They started with the run and they finished with the run. They were more physical and that's why they beat us. And it was really a lot of the negatives throughout the season for the Cowboys that reared its ugly head again in the loss to San Francisco. Let's start with the penalties. This was the most penalized team in the National Football League throughout the regular season. And Nate, when the wild card round came around, it didn't necessarily have any kind of solution to that problem. Uh, well, we was 14 for 89. I mean, we continued the thing. I mean, it's only been two teams in the playoffs with, uh, with the, well, four teams in the playoffs with that, those many penalties, and we had two of them. So, you know, we have to stop that. We have to become more disciplined and have better technique. Yeah, to me, I'm not surprised at all. Like you said, Kyle, this was the most penalized team in all of football, and we've seen it time and time again, whether it's offensively having a penalty that killed our drive or defensively getting a penalty that extended someone else's drive. And until we get, you know, better technique or we're a more disciplined team, I'm sorry, but we're going to see more and more of the same. Yeah, technique and being disciplined. Obviously, they, the Cowboys started the game off, literally started the game off with a penalty. <laughs> Randy Gregory was halfway across the dog on line of scrimmage, um, and then it just continued on from there. You know, Connor Williams and Randy Gregory both out there in the WWE slamming people. <laughs> it was just all bad all the way around. It really was, and Mike McCarthy in his end-of-the-year press conference talked about how the number one priority moving forward is shoring up the penalties, and the Cowboys had plenty of those on Sunday. As for the offense, though, the penalties certainly helped the hindrance of the offense, but just seven points in the first three quarters. It took a long time for this number one offense in the NFL to show out Isaiah what went wrong on that side of the ball. No, you go straight to the protection. You're seeing that show up on your screen right now. There was a lack of protection. That's been a problem uh, mostly most of the year. Uh, then you look at the aspect that Kellen Moore, Dak Prescott, whoever you want to put, point the finger at, were unwilling to take what the defense was giving them. They tried to force their hand, um, and unfortunately, that didn't work out for them. Yeah, to me, it boiled down to, you know, lack of um, giving your playmakers an opportunity. I mean, there's no way that Zeke and Pollard should combine for only 16 rushes the entire game. And then your number one receiver, at least statistically wise, C.D. Lamb, only gets one catch. I mean, your fourth re receiving option said Wilson had two times the targets that uh, C.D. Lamb had. And to me, that's just not acceptable. I just don't think it's fair that you don't give your offensive line opportunity to be physical on a team that's built on, that's their whole nature, that's their whole culture of being physical. We did not get the offensive line a chance to go forward enough, and it hurt us in the end. And even despite the struggles on offense, the defense really gave the Cowboys an opportunity late to come back and win that game. But Barry, when you look at the overarching figure of what the defense did under Dan Quinn and what could possibly be his final game as defensive coordinator, what did you see? And, and did they do exactly what they had done throughout the course of the season? Yeah, you know, I think they gave us definitely an opportunity to win the game, but I think this thing came to down to two things. They couldn't stop the run. They gave up 169 yards and two touchdowns, so they lost the battle in the trenches. And then secondly, 
this, I mean, as a whole, they couldn't get off the field. You know, third downs, the 49ers were able to convert 50% of their third downs. So when you can't get off the field, you can't stop the run, you're in for a long afternoon defensively. They did have a late interception. Anthony Brown got his hands on the football. He gave the Cowboys an opportunity late, but they could not convert. And Coach Mike McCarthy and his Cowboys are eliminated from the playoffs. But just what does this loss do to the coaching staff moving forward? Are there changes abound in Cowboys Nation? We answer that next. Special edition presented by AT&T is brought to you by Ford, built for Texas, built for you. Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Salvation Army, doing the most good. And by AT&T. This segment is brought to you by the Texas Lottery. Play the new Gym 7 Scratch Tickets. There's a Gym 7 Scratch Ticket for everyone, so play today. you have to prepare as if Kellen and Dan are, are going to be gone? I think you're always prepared for that, Todd. I mean, I, I mean it's, you know, it's a part of, frankly, it's a part of working here. I mean, it's this is an attractive place where, you know, we're a very good football team, you know, so uh, I, I think, you know, with that, um, you know, I think, uh, Opportunity, you know, movement is is higher than probably ever before. So I mean, you you got to be you know fluid with your with your staff and just you be, be ready to go. That's head coach Mike McCarthy on what the current state of the coaching staff could be. Brought to you by Nationwide as we welcome you back into Special Edition. And gentlemen, there could be changes on the way for the Cowboys coaching staff. More than likely, there will be changes on that coaching staff. Dan Quinn, Kellen Moore, and company all completely in the running for head coaching jobs throughout the NFL. But let's start with head coach Mike McCarthy. How much could this loss affect him moving forward when his main job, his main priority is to win playoff games? I mean, the reason why they brought him into this organization was because of his track record and his ability to lead teams to the playoffs and then ultimately to host the Lombardi Trophy. This raises a huge concern, obviously, being that the Joneses did absolutely everything in their power to ensure that they had a solid coaching staff and ensure that this roster was completely stacked offensively and defensively, and this ended up being the result. I think there's a lot of clear concern now in terms of what he can do for this organization going forward. Yeah, he was definitely brought here to get this team over the hump. You know, he's a Super Bowl winning coach. He's been to the top of the mountains. And there are some concerns going forward. But if I'm Mike McCarthy, I'm going to ownership. And I'm saying, look, I, I need to call these plays next year. You know, I know Kellen Moore's offense was great during the regular season. But when it came down to big games and when it mattered the most, the offense was non-existent. And if we're going to go down, I'm gonna at least go down calling the plays that I want to call. He only has one problem, and that's just being physical. Getting these guys physical and getting them ready for the big game, like you said, Church. When we played against a winning team that's in the playoffs, we, we were a non-existent team when it came to the running game and they're playing great defense. I'm talking about getting three and out. And that, they didn't do it this year. And so Mike McCarthy need to concentrate on that, and he should be okay. One of the focuses for Coach Mike McCarthy this year was allowing the coordinators to really do their job untouched. And Barry, you already touched on it a minute ago. Maybe there needs to be a little bit more of that input as we take a look at what the coordinators have done this season and what they could do next season. As these are the quarter coordinator interviews overall, the Broncos, Vikings, Jaguars, all in there with the Miami Dolphins interviewing both Dan Quinn and Kellen more, of course, Dan Quinn's list a little bit longer than Moore's at the moment. But let's start with Dan Quinn. Turn around on the defensive side of the football, Barry. It was as impressive as any coaching job in the league this season. What's next for Dan Quinn, and where could he end up? He has a lot of possibilities, as we just saw on that list. I mean, and rightfully so. I mean, this guy came in here and turned one of the historically bad defenses into a respectable defense out there, and they took the ball away better than any team in the National Football League. So when you have success like that, other teams are going to want your services. So I'm proud of what Dan Quinn was able to do with this defense. Hopefully we're able to keep him, but I think it's going to be a tough task. And he's got plenty of opportunities on the table. As for Kellen Moore on the other side, how did the last part of the season really affect the way he is viewed throughout the NFL, Isaiah? It showed that his bag was half full. <clears throat> it showed that, you know, obviously he came out shooting the first half, but the second half of the year he seemingly ran out of gusto. Um, he lost momentum. He lost, you know, lost uh, his, his way on the terms of the tracks to this, to this goal line. And I feel as if that's really going to affect his ability because now people are having concerns. Can he lead an offense? Can he lead these young men in the locker room? And then ultimately, can he lead other grown men that are going to be uh, in the term of coaches? And not only are other organizations answering that question about Kellen Moore at the moment, but the Cowboys are going to have to answer that question moving forward as well if he is 
is going to be the offensive coordinator and what kind of personnel is he going to have to deal with in the future because the Cowboys have a long list of unrestricted free agents, including that man right there, Dalton Schultz. What are the Cowboys going to do in free agency when we come back with more special edition? This segment was brought to you by the Texas Lottery. This segment is brought to you by Ford. Built for Texas, built for you. Welcome back to Special Edition here from the Star in Frisco alongside Isaiah Stanback, Barry Church, Nate Newton. I'm Kyle Yeomans. As we take a look at some of the offensive free agents for the Dallas Cowboys entering this offseason, there are 22 in total. Here are some of the offensive notables this season, starting with that wide receiving core. Michael Gallup, Cedric Wilson, Noah Brown, Malik Turner, Dalton Schultz, a lot of pass catchers on that list. And then you go back to the offensive line with Connor Williams, a starter up front, at least toward the back half of the season. So you see the complete list there. Isaiah, I want you to start with Michael Gallup. Could his injury potentially allow him to come back to the Cowboys, maybe on a cheaper deal? Yeah, fortunately, but unfortunately for him. I mean, I, obviously he worked his whole career to get to the position that he was in to go out there and show, have a great showing this year and put himself in a situation to take advantage of free agency. But due to his, his leg injury um, now, I think he's going to have to be reverted back to signing back with the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah, I can see him taking that, that one year prove it type deal with his team. I mean, he's familiar with the offense and more importantly, he's familiar with the training staff because having an injury this big that late in the season, he might not be ready until preseason comes around. So to me, I mean, he might take that familiarity over the bag at this point in his career right now. That's the best move physically, financially and mentally. You know, that way you feel safe and you feel good because you know the people that are working with you. What about Dalton Schultz? Just the second tight end in Cowboys history to have over 800 yards in a season. Along with Jason Witten, Nate, do you think that he could be somebody that the Cowboys could let walk or do you need to bring him back? Well, your other tight end got paid a couple of years ago. So maybe if they don't overlap, that may become a with Blake Jarvis. They don't overlap. They make him sign him back, but if it overlaps, it, it's not gonna, they're not going to sign him back. Uh, yeah, I would hate to lose Dalton Schultz. I mean, he was such a security blanket and overall playmaker for this team. Uh, but to me, I'm not breaking the bank for him because uh, he's not as dynamic as a Kelsey, a Kittle, or even a Mark Andrews. So I can see the Cowboys letting him walk come this offseason. He doesn't show the versatility necessary to give him the paycheck that you gave Jarwin. So in reality, you know, based upon Nate's point, you know, you're ready to pay one. I think you're going to have to watch him walk away. And where would Cedric Wilson fit on this list as a guy who really filled in for Michael Gallup whenever they needed him the most? He's, he's your Swiss Army knife. You, you better find a way to bring him back. Um, obviously, <laughs> he'll, he'll have some value out there on the, on the open market, but I think he knows what he means to this organization. Yeah, without a doubt, I would love to bring Seth Wilson back as well. Like you said, he's a Swiss Army knife. He can do multiple things out there, especially in the slot. Um, but the thing that I'm worried about with Seth Wilson is there's so much going on on the defensive side of the football. I think those priorities might push him further and further down the list, and I'm not sure if they'll bring him back just off a of priority. I agree 100% with you, Barry, but you know what? You better get your slot receiver move CD outside because we don't know what's going to happen with the other guy. And I'm talking about Amari. Yeah, with Amari Cooper, there are certainly some possibilities there. Possibilities up front as well at the offensive line. And Nate, since you are our resident offensive lineman here, we'll start with you on this one. Is Connor Williams back next year in a Cowboys uniform, or should they at least entertain that option? It's a, your last uh, your last look at the, at the film. If it don't show well, you may be gone. And it did not show well. Bye, Connor. Ooh, that was <laughs> rough from Nate Newton. Barry? Yeah, I'm going to keep it short like Nate on this one. I'm, I'm going to say it's a no. I think the Cowboys have seen all they wanted in uh, Connor Williams, and I think they move on from the left guard uh, this offseason. He is who we thought he was. And that's exactly what they saw really going back into the back half of the season. What about the defensive side of the football? What about Randy Gregory and company? Who could the Cowboys bring back from the turnaround in Big D? This segment was brought to you by Ford. Built for Texas, built for you. This segment is brought to you by AT&T. So we just took a look at the offensive side of the football. What does the defense have in store throughout this 2022 offseason as we welcome you back here to special edition and 
Well, here's the list of free agents. It's a little bit longer than what they had on the offensive side of the football. And depending on who you ask, some bigger names up there as well. Randy Gregory certainly right up at the top of that list. Jaron Curse, who was a huge part in the Dan Quinn turnaround on the defensive side of the football, along with Malik Hooker, Demonte KZ, Leighton Vander Esch, who was a first round pick back in 2018. So many names that could carry some weight. But let's start with Randy Gregory. And Barry, I'll start with you on this one. Is he one of the highest priorities for the Cowboys this offseason? I would have to say yes. I would have to say yes. I think he's one of the highest priorities out there. I think he's a cornerstone piece of this defense. I think he can be one of those premier pass rushers in the National Football League if he can stay healthy. And if I'm a Cowboys, if I'm one of the top you know, guys up, up at the front office, I'm giving him an opportunity. If that's franchise tag or if that's a long-term term contract, I'm getting Randy Gregory back in the star. I disagree. Wow. And I and the reason why I would love to have him back as well, but I think the price that he's going to require is going to be completely too high. If you try to even look at doing a franchise tag, he's going to be up there pushing $20 million a year. So I just think that he's just that it's too high. It's too yeah. high. You have to get to this kid quick, him and his agent, and get a deal done because I'm not franchising him. That's too high and that's too long. That's too taking too much from the team. This team was built on a lot of pieces this year, and we have to hurry up and find those pieces, and that, and that won't happen with a long-term contract like and that. Maybe that is the way that they avoid the franchise tag with Gregory is get him signed beforehand. No franchise tag in the conversation for Leighton Vander Esch at the moment. However, they may need to bring him at, back just out of the fact that there were just two Cowboys linebackers under contract, and that's Micah Parsons and Jabril Coxberry. Do you bring back LVE after the year that he had? I'd say yes, and it's just, just because of what you just said. I mean, if you look at the depth behind him, there's two young linebackers if, he's, if he leaves, and one of which only had a handful of snaps. So if I'm the Dallas Cowboys, I'm bringing LVE back, but similar to Dalton Schultz, I'm not breaking the bank to do so. I'm with you 100%, and there's no argument there. I don't think that you bring LVE back. I think that he's going to sign somewhere else simply because he's going to be looking to get that bag, and the bag is not here with Dallas Cowboys. And now what about Jaron Curse? Is he going to get a bag just based off of the fact that he played so well in a big safety role for Dan Quinn's defense? I think Jaron Curse would be wherever Dan Quinn is at. Ah. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, to me, I think, uh, look, Curtis had a heck of a season. He, he exceeded expectations a lot out there. But the only question I have is, is he a system guy? Because like you said, if Quinn leaves, are we still going to get that productive safety or is, were we just going to get a guy that was a, was a system guy? So to me, there's questions about him, but I'd bring him back. I know I'm off the beaten path, but you better keep Dan Quinn because he put all of this together. If he leaves, it falls apart. I'm, it yeah. really does. It, yeah. it, do, it goes back to what <laughs> what Isaiah just said. KZ's not there. If the, even that's a conversation yeah. to be had, Jaron Curse is certainly not there if Dan Quinn isn't. So that is a big thing moving forward. What about keys to a successful offseason? How can the Cowboys turn things around and really build themselves for the future? This segment was brought to you by AT&T. Special edition presented by AT&T was brought to you by Ford. Built for Texas, built for you. Miller Lite, the only beer of the Dallas Cowboys. AT&T. And by NFL Game Pass. You'll never miss a game again. Enjoy full and condensed game replays from week one to the Super Bowl. Subscribe at DallasCowboys.com slash Game Pass. It is the final segment of special edition for the 2021 season as we welcome you back to the star in Frisco in the Globe Life Studios. He's Isaiah Stanback, Barry Church, Nate Newton. I'm Kyle Yeomans and gentlemen, let's end this thing on a high note. How can the Cowboys get back to the playoffs a year from now and have a better shot at probably going into a deeper run than they did this year, Nate? Number one, they have to get our interior offensive lineman, be it guard or center, maybe two of them. And then we have to go out and find us a run blocking tight end that may can catch passes, but he has to be a run blocking tight end. And number three, you have to have a run stopping defensive lineman to add to the rotation so we can get him in the later rounds. To me, it all boils down to you got to make sure you got Dan Quinn in the building. I mean, this guy, do whatever you got to do. I mean, I know he's getting courted by a lot of teams out there, but do whatever you got to do to get this guy back in the building. He was responsible for making this defense as good as it was and getting the most out of his players. Please bring Dan Quinn back. 
I'm on the Dan Quinn train as well. BC took it out of my mouth, but I want to go along with that as well as identifying the fact that you have to become a more physical football team. You have the personnel currently. Hopefully you can retain a lot, a lot of it, but going into next season, you have to take this last game as a lesson and recognize that you need to be physically imposing upon the, the, the teams that you're going to be facing. You need to take, take that next step. You felt like there were opportunities this year for that to be the case, but ultimately when it boiled down to it, the playoffs were here. You were under the bright lights. That did not happen in the Cowboys fall in the wild card round 23 to 17 to the 49ers. Special thanks to our entire DallasCowboys.com crew for special edition this year for Isaiah, Barry, Nate. I'm Kyle Yeomans. We'll see you next season here from Dallas Cowboys headquarters at the Star in Frisco.